Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, Welcome back to the White House. Thank you for being here for your daily briefing. Uh, I hope uh, everyone in this room got uh, some downtime uh, with their family and friends. Uh, Everyone needs a break sometime, uh, and I hope uh, you took advantage of the break that the President took. Uh, We are back, back in action, ready to go to work uh, for the American people, and uh, as I know you are on behalf of your readers and viewers and listeners. Uh, With that, I have no other announcements. I will go straight to the Associated Press. Thanks, Jay. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Two uh, quick domestic questions and then one foreign matter I wanted to ask you about, please. Um, Can you give us a sense of how the President plans to follow the the, um, Iowa caucus returns tonight? Is is he watching on television? Is he uh, planning to get uh, updates from advisors? I know he's obviously speaking to Mm -hmm. supporters on the Democratic side, but how does he plan to follow the (coughs) the Republicans? I confess I haven't had that conversation with him yet. Uh, I know, because I know him, that he's not a big TV watcher uh, when it comes to news. He tends to uh, he read things uh, either on paper or online, so he may uh, hear about it that way, either from advisors or if he's uh, following it directly. He will, as, as you mentioned, be delivering uh, remarks to uh, Iowa Democratic caucus goers uh, this evening. From, uh, from Washington uh, via video link, link. Uh, and he will use that opportunity to thank his supporters in Iowa, who will turn out by the thousands, uh, for uh, what they did four years ago in showing up at the caucuses in record numbers and delivering him an important and historic victory. Uh, and, and I think I can remind you that uh, that night in the speech he gave after his win in Iowa, he made some promises. One of them was to end the Iraq War. Another was to succeed where others over a hundred years had not succeeded and deliver uh, broad health care reform to the American people. Uh, Another was to make uh, progress in clean energy. Um, He continues to, and a fourth was education reform. So he will talk about those things, uh, the things that have been accomplished, uh, thanks to his supporters in Iowa and across the country, uh, and on behalf of uh, Americans everywhere, uh, and all the work that needs to be done. So that's, that'll be his focus this evening. Like, like many of us, he will, I'm sure, uh, be interested to see what the results are in the other parties' caucuses. Um, I'm sure he is as... Uh, No more or less interested than the rest of us. No more interested? <laughs> well, I think in the sense that I think that he knows uh, what his uh, focus is right now, which is continuing to work on behalf of the American people, continuing to do whatever he can, working with Congress and with the private sector and through executive action to grow the economy and create jobs, to help protect the middle class and expand it. That's what his focus is how long the process takes and the other party to pick a nominee is really uh, anyone's guess. So, uh, you know, he, he's got a lot of work to do before he engages uh, aggressively in the uh, general election campaign. That will come uh, in due time. Okay. Um, in Ohio tomorrow, can you give us any preview about whether this is a, uh, a broad economic uh, message or does he uh, plan to follow up on specific elements of the Jobs Act or the year the payroll tax, uh, which we expect? Well, I don't want to give you specifics. He will be carrying an economic message. He will be echoing uh, a number of the themes that you heard him talk about last year in the fall and early winter. He'll uh, talk again, as I just mentioned, about how his commitment is to do everything he can as president, working with Congress and independently from Congress to grow the economy and create jobs to protect the middle class, to expand it and to make uh, the middle class more accessible to those who aspire to it. Uh, That's his number one focus. And going back to Iowa four years ago, that was his number one focus then, even predating the economic crisis that led to the worst recession since the Great Depression. Uh, So I think those will be the themes that you'll hear from him tomorrow. I don't have uh, any more specifics for you. One other topic, please. Um, should Americans be worried about what appears to be an escalating conflict with Iran today? Iran has uh, warned the United States to keep its aircraft carrier away from the Gulf, returning to the Gulf. The Pentagon says that it has no plans to do that. I mean, 
is this is this bluster from a historical perspective, or do you think that this is something that you should worry about? I think it reflects uh, the fact that Iran is in a position of weakness. It's the latest round of Iranian yeah. threats, and it's confirmation that Tehran is under increasing pressure uh, for its continued failures to live up to its international obligation. Uh, Iran is isolated and is seeking to divert attention from its behavior and domestic problems. Uh, this is simply a measure of uh, the uh, impact that sanctions have been having on Iran and, and the uh, broad international uh, support for taking uh, putting pressure on Iran and isolating Iran because of its refusal to live up to its international uh, obligations. I, I think one measure of that is uh, a, post, a story that was in the Washington Post this morning about the dramatic decline in the Iranian currency as a result of some of the latest sanctions uh, that have been imposed on Iran. So, um, And that's not the latest sign. I, I, I stood before you in uh, November and December and talked about uh, the obvious impact that the isolation had been having on the Iranian economy and, and the effect that it had on uh, things we were hearing from the Iranian leadership uh, and uh, on the economy itself. So uh, I think that continues, and I think this is uh, more indication of that. Okay. The New York Times today has some details on the defense cuts that the President will propose in February, and I understand there's going to be a news conference later this week um, by Panetta. With the President having seen the details of what these cuts will look like, is he concerned about the overall ability of the United States to defend itself and this question of whether the United States will still be able to fight two wars? Well, let me, let me talk broadly about the Defense Strategic Review, which recognizes that we are at a turning point after a decade of war uh, with new challenges and opportunities that call for a reshaping of our defense priorities. To meet these new challenges under increased budget constraints, the President made clear to his team that we need to take a hard look at all of our defense, uh, defense spending to ensure that spending cuts are surgical and that our top priorities are met. This review is ongoing and will ensure that we are able to meet the challenges of this moment responsibly and emerge even stronger in a manner that preserves our global leadership, maintains our military superiority, and keeps faith with our troops, military families, and veterans. The President has been deeply involved in this process. He's personally engaged uh, in the defense strategy. Uh, he has met with Secretary Panetta, Chairman Dempsey, and uh, other senior DOD leaders six times since September. And in December, the President took the unprecedented step of bringing all of the combatant commanders to the White House for consultations. Having said that, I, I think it's important to point out that the uh, cuts in defense spending that we've discussed, uh, around which uh, uh, the Defense Strategic Review is being uh, written about now, were agreed to on a broadly bipartisan basis, uh, roughly $489 billion over 10 years. Um, and the important part of this process is that the strategy come first, and the reductions come uh, are, are driven by the strategy. They're not across the board. They're not random. And, and that's certainly the approach that the President will take. Now, above and beyond that, there could be double that amount of cuts, um, $500 billion additional if there's a sequestration. Mm -hmm. um, does the White House plan to give us any kind of glimpse of what those cuts would mean when the budget is released in February? Not that I'm aware of, Karen. We firmly believe that Congress should fulfill the responsibility that was uh, taken, it took upon itself uh, as a result of the Budget Control Act and, and uh, take actions necessary to ensure that the sequester never happens. The, 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 the sequestration, the sequester was designed uh, to be onerous uh, so that it never took place, uh, that it was an alternative that neither party preferred and therefore uh, compelled both parties to compromise in uh, finding a broader uh, balanced approach to deficit reduction. We, th we believe that even though the Super Committee's tenure has expired, that there is still ample opportunity, if Congress is willing, uh, to take a bal balanced approach, if Republicans are willing, uh, to a go along with what every bipartisan commission that's looked at this, what everybody who takes this issue seriously acknowledges, and that is that we have to have a balanced approach to deficit reduction. If, if that happens, and it can happen, uh, then the sequester will never be an issue. And just a quick 
quick follow on Ben's question on Ohio. Mm -hmm. Will there be new policy unveiled there, maybe an executive action? Well, I don't want to get ahead of the President, and I don't have anything more specific to say about uh, his remarks uh, or events tomorrow in Ohio, except that it will be, uh, they will be focused on the economy and on what he can do as President to uh, deliver on his promise to do everything he can to help the middle class grow the economy and create jobs, uh, working with Congress collaboratively where we can, and, and uh, either with the private sector or through executive action, uh, where we must. So um, that's the message he'll carry to Ohio, and it's, it's a message you have heard uh, him deliver around the country uh, since he introduced the American Jobs Act in September. This is his focus. This is the primary um, focus of his domestic efforts right now, and, it, and it, it's a continuation of a of a, a cause that began with his decision to run uh, first for the Senate and then for the presidency. I mean, this is a theme that has dominated his, uh, his time in the, on the national stage, and it will continue throughout his presidency because, as he said on numerous occasions, he will not rest uh, until he knows that every American who's looking for a job can find a job. Um, I'll go to Jill, then I'll start moving back. Yeah. Thanks. Welcome uh, back yeah, to the White House. Glad to be here. Um, you know, could you, one domestic, one international, please. Uh, on the domestic question, could you give us a little bit more clarity on this with or without Congress? Mm -hmm. Because it's being interpreted by some, Gingrich, for example, as virtually a monarchy. The president says, you know, can't work with Congress, I'll do it myself. And there's a lot of criticism. Could it, if you can explain exactly, mm -hmm. you know, what the idea of that is, and whether sure. it could backfire, whether he would look as if he is trying to just ignore Congress, and then we can get into the international. Sure. No, I appreciate the question. I, 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 we have made clear, and the president has made clear for a long time now, that he will do whatever he can uh, to help the economy, to help it grow, to help it create jobs, to protect the middle class. Uh, a lot of that work needs to be done and has to be done with Congress. And after he introduced the American Jobs Act and pushed and pushed and pushed Congress to act on the American Jobs Act, some provisions of it were acted on. And he will not let up on that pressure. And he hopes and anticipates that Congress will return to Washington and that Republicans in particular will show a willingness to work with him to deliver on this number one priority of his and the American people's, which is the need to continue to have the economy grow, to continue this recovery, and to continue the kind of job creation uh, that we need to bring down the unemployment rate. Um, so this is not an uh, either-or, it's a both-and situation. He will work with Congress, and, and we believe, actually, that there will be opportunities to work with Congress, beginning with expanding, uh, extending the payroll tax cut for the full calendar year. Uh, we absolutely believe that Congress uh, will do the right thing and continue upon the work that was finally achieved in late December and extend the payroll tax cut for the full calendar year, extend unemployment insurance for the full calendar year, extend the so-called doc fix. But, but there are more things that need to be done. There are elements of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Jobs Act that uh, we believe, uh, as we did from the beginning, uh, merit bipartisan consideration and support. This country is in crying need of uh, work on its infrastructure. Now is a great time to do that work. And there has historically been bipartisan support for uh, supporting infrastructure uh, projects across the country. Uh, we should take action on that. We hope to work with Congress to take action on that, uh, to continue to grow the economy and create jobs. Separate from that, and this was the case last year and will be the case this year, we can't wait for Congress to act. And when Congress refuses to act, when Republicans choose the path of obstruction rather than cooperation, then the President's not going to sit here. This gridlock in Washington is not an excuse for inaction. He's going to take the actions that he can take using his executive authority uh, to help the cause here, to help uh, Americans deal with this challenging economy. And they can be small, medium, or large actions. And, and they don't have to be just executive authority actions. They can be things that we can do working with the private sector. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, he'll pursue all tracks. 
but it is it is not accurate to suggest that uh, he doesn't want to and uh, engage with Congress and that he won't engage with Congress. In fact, he he wants to continue to work with Congress. He and his advisors believe that there will be opportunities to cooperate with Congress this year. Uh, we we believe that I mean as a purely political matter that the uh, some members of Congress who have pursued uh, an obstructionist path uh, may begin to see it in their political interests uh, to actually uh, demonstrate to their constituents that they can get some things done. And we hope that's the case because that may provide some more opportunities for cooperation. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take every approach available to us on behalf of the American people. And just this uh, question about the Taliban, mm -hmm. they're apparently opening up a, an office in Qatar. <coughs> they also are asking for um, return of Taliban prisoners held in Guantanamo. How does the White House look at both of those issues? Well, two things. As the President said uh, in June, peace cannot come to Afghanistan without a political settlement. Going back to his speech at West Point, the President uh, has made clear that we would support and participate in Afghan-led Afghan reconciliation efforts. And uh, we We've always said that Taliban reconciliation uh, would only come uh, on the condition of uh, breaking from al-Qaeda, abandoning violence, and abiding by the Afghan constitution. And that remains the case. And this is about U.S. support for an Afghan-led process. Uh, as far as uh, releasing Afghan prisoners, you know, we're not in a position to discuss ongoing deliberations uh, or individual det detainees. Uh, but our goal of closing Guantanamo uh, is well established and widely, widely understood. Uh, Chair. Jay, uh, will the President be accompanied by either Congresswoman Kaptur or Congressman Kucinich when he's in Cleveland tomorrow? You know, I just don't have any uh, specifics to give to you on tomorrow's trip. And when he's talking to supporters in Iowa tonight, is any, uh, you were just talking about the relationship with Congress, is there any <coughs> broad shift in the change of the relationship, the working relationship that he has with Congress that's part of the, the 2012 strategy? I, I don't think so. I think that our, his approach is to engage, uh, to press Congress, to take action on the, on the highest priorities of the American people, which are now so focused on the economy, on growth and job creation. And he'll continue to do that. And he'll continue to do it in a way uh, that maximizes the potential for a positive result. And that's why you saw him in the fall travel around the country, uh, talking to Americans in, in states uh, north, south, east, and west about the need for Congress to take action on the American Jobs Act, about the need to uh, extend the payroll tax cut, you know, provide uh, money for infrastructure, uh, jobs uh, that will uh, not just create jobs right now, but help build the foundation that this economy needs for the 21st century. And he'll continue to do that. Uh, we had some success with that approach. Uh, in the end, we uh, were able to pass some measures of the American Jobs Act. Uh, we were able to extend the payroll tax cut and unemployment insurance and uh, the SGR for uh, two months. Uh, it is inconceivable to us that Congress will not extend it for the full calendar year. That'll be a good thing for the economy. It'll be a good thing for the average American family out there, a uh, $1,000 tax cut in 2012. That will help them make ends meet, and it will help the economy uh, by pumping that money back in uh, to local businesses, uh, which in turn will then uh, seek to hire more people. So if the President's happy with a relationship that, the way you just described it, yielded some success? Well, he's, he's focused on making the relationship work for the American people. And that requires uh, a cooperative relationship where uh, he and members of Congress, leaders and rank and file members, are willing to uh, compromise to get essential things done. We saw some progress in 2011. And don't forget, we passed uh, important three trade agreements, three important trade agreements, uh, as well as measures uh, from the American Jobs Act, and we, we, we anticipate that there will be other opportunities this year as, as uh, members of Congress uh, choose to do the right thing for the economy and also perhaps see it in their political interest to uh, demonstrate to their constituents that they've 
uh, delivered on uh, the American people's overwhelming number one priority. Glenn. Jay, just to follow up on that point. Um, quite recently, there have been uh, the members of uh, the staff that have uh, said that you know you have 60 to 70 uh, Democratic members that have been prevailed upon to pass most of the big pieces of legislation in the House last year. Um, do you think uh, Speaker Boehner should uh, sort of get rid of this uh, strategy of his to require things to be passed exclusively by a Republican majority? and just accept the fact that this is almost coalition governing? Well, I, I, I wouldn't presume to uh, tell Speaker Boehner what his best political approach should be. What I think is best for the American people is that um, everyone recognize that we have divided government. That is the fundamental nature of our system. And, and in this particular instance, we have a situation where there's a Democratic president and Republicans control the House and, and they uh, have a lot of power in the Senate because of their uh, ability to filibuster and willingness to filibuster virtually anything. Uh, and that means that to get real things done, there has to be some bipartisan cooperation. There's no other way around it. Um, the President has been committed to that kind of approach uh, throughout his presidency and, and, and throughout uh, the duration of this Congress when the Republicans have had uh, control of the House and substantial control in the Senate. He'll continue to take that approach. Do you think Speaker Boehner, I mean, we saw a situation with the payroll tax uh, increase where he was, uh, he had to go back to the drawing board after having a, uh, a tough conference call with some of his membership. We, you know, we all knew who were covering this that, you know, there were a substantial number of Democratic votes in that. Why do you think that that wasn't part of his uh, calculation when, in fact, it was uh, part of the ultimate deal? Well, again, I, I wouldn't want to uh, guess what was going through any congressional leader's mind during that process. What I know was the focus of the president uh, was on the need to extend the payroll tax cut. And there was no um, exception to that focus for the president. It, he knew it had to happen. It was the right thing for the economy uh, and the right thing for the 160 million Americans who uh, could not afford to have their taxes go up this week. And so he, he, he kept the pressure on Congress to act. He kept the pressure on Republican leaders to act. And he was uh, gratified that in the end uh, they did. The, I think the point that you're making is, is, is worth remembering that there was a process through much of last year where a uh, segment of the House Republican caucus seemed to dictate the direction that the House Republicans would take, uh, which prevented the kind of compromise uh, that might have been achieved in some other areas. Uh, and that is regrettable. Hopefully, that dynamic will change this year because the American people demand it. They really want Washington to work for them. They don't much care uh, about uh, ideological purity or uh, the, the, the psychic benefits of uh, winning by losing, they want uh, their elected officials in Washington to compromise and do the right thing for the economy, for jobs. All the way in the back, yeah. Uh, is the White House has any concern of Mr. Ahmadinejad free to Central and South America? Uh, and there's many Latin American journalists says, He's taking advantage of U.S. has put little attention to, to the region in the last couple of years. Is, is there any concern that he's taking advantage of that? Well, I would disagree with the assertion uh, about this administration's focus. It's uh, we have a robust level of engagement with Latin America that uh, has persisted for three years. We, the president made a very important trip to the region earlier uh, in well in the spring of last year. And uh, we continue to engage at, at many levels with Latin America. Uh, you know, Iranian behavior that we're focused on right now is its refusal to live up to its international obligations with regards to its nuclear program. And uh, what we've seen out of Iran is, is uh, a series of indications uh, that the pressure on them is mounting and that, and that their economy uh, and their leadership is feeling the uh, impact of that pressure. Uh, that's what we're focused on right now. But is currently, you know, trade business to South America and Central America, is there a concern mm -hmm. in that regard to the U.S. going? I, again, I think that we're, we're uh, 
focused on our engagement with Central and South America, which we uh, intend to uh, continue to have at a robust level. Uh, we have very important partnerships with countries in the region uh, that we'll uh, continue to develop and grow, uh, both uh, diplomatically and economically. And, and, and as regards Iran, we're going to focus very clearly on Iran's unwillingness to get right with the world and become responsible with regards to its international obligations. Margaret. I'm sorry, then I'll, yeah. Quick domestic, maybe not as quick international. Um, can you give us beyond tomorrow uh, any sense of the rest of the week? Uh, and then, um, you want a week ahead? Yeah. Um, and Did Josh, then, you didn't give him one? <laughs> it is a, um, a new year, and uh, the violence so in Syria is continuing. And I'm wondering if you can talk um, from the podium about what sort of contingency planning is happening um, at the NSC level, State Department level. Does President Obama think that you may need to adopt more of a Libya-esque approach in the coming weeks? What's what's going to happen next? Well, I, I, thank you for your question. I. I'll say what I've said in the past, which is we, the President takes no options off the table in, in this situation, uh, but we are very focused on a diplomatic uh, approach. And, um, you know, it's been 16 days since the Syrian regime uh, signed the protocol on Arab League observers and nine weeks since it agreed to the Arab League four-point plan of action. Uh, we have made clear that if the Arab League initiative is not implemented, the international community will have to consider new measures to compel a halt to the regime's violence against its own citizens. You know, as sniper fire, torture, and murder in Syria continue, it is clear that the requirements of the Arab League protocol have not been met. Across the country, the Syrian people continue to suffer at the hand of the Assad regime and its indiscriminating killing or indiscriminate killing of scores of civilians continues. Uh, so we're, we're going to continue to work with our uh, international partners. Uh, we uh, believe it's past time for the Security Council to act. Uh, we want to see the international community stand together, united in support of the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people. Um, but we're working with our international partners to uh, increase the uh, pressure on the Assad regime uh, to cease the uh, uh, completely uh, unacceptable violence that it's been perpetrating on its own citizens. Bill, did you have something? Have a weekend. Weekend. I don't have a week ahead for you. I just don't. So. Uh, <laughs> Does it depend on what happens in Iowa? No, it does not. It, it depends not a bit on what happens in Iowa. Um, we're very confident that the president's going to win overwhelmingly in the Democratic caucuses tonight. Uh, the uh, I just uh, we'll, we'll get you more details on the rest of the week as as they become available. Bill, do you have anything? Yeah. Thanks, Jake. Um, I know you said there were no announcements, but your deputy, Josh Ernest, announced that he's getting engaged in Hawaii, so we congratulate We him. all congratulate oh, Josh, if you didn't know. It's a wonderful development. After having said something nice about him, I just wanted to ask about something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it as, as a transition. Um, I think these questions about the relationship with Congress, what I'm trying to understand is when, when Josh was put it in Hawaii as saying, um, quote, if the playing field includes working with Congress, all the better. But I think my point is that that's no longer a requirement. I think people, critics of the administration, mm -hmm. were jumping on the idea that you're, the president is not required to work with Congress. When you were saying a moment ago that the American people want to see Washington work together, how can you on one hand say we're not really required to work with them, but on the other hand, the American people want us to? Well, because Ed, the point that we're making is that uh, during the many engagements with Congress in the previous year, 2011. Uh, one that we all remember very well were, uh, was the, uh, uh, the multi-week uh, process uh, that became known as the debt ceiling crisis or the debt ceiling negotiations. And one, I think, uh, important and underappreciated uh, outcome of that process, uh, which did not, unfortunately, result in both sides coming together around a grand bargain because, in the end, Speaker Boehner uh, simply did not have enough Republicans behind him to support that, uh, was the President's insistence that Republicans could not force this country to go through that crisis again every six months or so, which was their stated desire. Um, the President prevailed 
in ensuring that that would not happen, that the uh, debt ceiling issue uh, had been removed from the table until 2013. And, and I think that that is very important for the American people because, as I think some of us noted at the end of December, uh, some of the stated concern about the uncertainty created by uh, a two-month uh, extension of the payroll tax cut uh, coming from the same corner of Congress where people were uh, not just willing to uh, throw the global economy into an uncertain state, but seem to be relishing the prospect of it by having the United States default on its obligations, uh, was very ironic. And, and the President made sure, through those negotiations that led to the Budget Control Act, uh, that that would not happen again uh, in this Congress. So <clears throat> I think that's what we're talking about, that there is not – obviously there is business we uh, will do with Congress, there's business we must do with Congress, and there's absolutely business we want to do with Congress. And as I said earlier in this briefing, we actually are somewhat hopeful that uh, Congress, and, and, and in this regard I mean Republicans in Congress, will be more willing to compromise and cooperate uh, as they view it in their own self-interest to do so, because uh, I don't think uh, – I know focus have been uh, – the focus has largely been uh, lately on uh, the primaries in terms of the polling data, but uh, the polling data also continues to show th this Congress uh, registering historically low levels of approval among the American people, polling data that shows that uh, a huge portion of the American people view this Congress to be the worst in history. Uh, that can't be good on your resume as you're running for re-election uh, in November if you're a member of uh, Congress, and in particular because I think folks associate the obstructionism with the Republican Party, I think it's a particular problem for Republicans in the House. So, you know, we hope that, that the dynamic will continue to change in a way that leads towards opportunities for cooperation and compromise. A quick follow-up. Um, uh, in terms of working with Congress, the President, four years ago tonight in Iowa, you mentioned he said we want health care reform. He got that in Iraq, uh, ending the war. But he also said something about he wanted a world where uh, the world would see America differently. America would see itself as a nation less divided and more united. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the talking points of Mitt Romney in particular has been pushing lately is the idea that this president's a great divider, I think he's been saying, mm -hmm. something about how he hasn't met with Speaker Boehner in six months, uh, you know, along the same <laughs> well, lines. I think he had to admit that that wasn't the case. But uh, so, in that interview, <laughs> where uh, I forget who did the interview, but rightly pointed out that that, that it had been uh, more recent than that. And so, of course, they have spoken on the phone since then. But look, I. There's no question that uh, Washington remains uh, too partisan, that uh, folks here uh, place uh, party over country too often. Certainly the President feels that way. And he continues to work on uh, doing ev everything he can to uh, bring the country together and Washington together. Uh, what we have seen, and I think that it's simply a matter of fact, if you if you look at surveys of the American people, is that uh, unfortunately Republicans in Congress have pursued a path of of blocking everything and obstructing everything, whether it's nominations or appointments or uh, <coughs> things that used to enjoy bipartisan support, like payroll tax cuts or infrastructure spending, and. And that's not lost on the American people. But what, what is also true is that there's still another year of this Congress in which uh, we can change all that. Uh, a lot of folks have asked me in, 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 in recent weeks about, well, yeah, the President wants to run against a do-nothing Congress. And, and the fact is the President would like nothing more than to be deprived of the opportunity to run against a do-nothing Congress, because Congress uh, could deprive him of that opportunity if Republicans were willing to do something uh, or to do more. So. Uh, we continue to look forward to those opportunities. Laura. Um, two follow-up questions. On that point, is it still accurate, though, to describe the payroll tax and UI as the only must-do pieces of legislation on the agenda for next well, for this year? Look, I think that it's accurate in the sense that it's an absolute uh, necessity for the economy and that the President is absolutely committed to making it happen. And uh, we believe that it, it is inconceivable that Republicans in Congress would want to go through this process again and somehow prevent it from happening. Uh, 
it would be bad for the economy and bad for 160 million Americans. So we believe it's a must do and it will happen. Well, you know, again, I think that, that what, what, what we were talking about there is about uh, the comparison to 2011 where because of the leverage the Republicans took on to themselves by linking, uh, raising the debt ceiling uh, to deficit reduction and, and the, the game of chicken that they engaged in around that in the summer, uh, that that was very damaging to the economy. And that the president, as president, absolutely had to do everything he could to prevent default. And that, and that uh, was a very challenging situation. Uh, he made sure in the negotiations that led to the, uh, the, the, the Budget Control Act that uh, Republicans in Congress would not get their wish to do this again in December of 2011 or to do this again sometime in calendar year 2012, uh, which is a good thing for the economy and good for the American people and means that uh, debt ceiling issues are not must do this year, which is a good thing. You, uh, in, in terms of what's happening with the Taliban, you mentioned what the U.S. objectives were in any sort of negotiated settlement, but do you have any specific reaction to the opening of the office in Qatar? Is that a positive development? Well, we welcome any step that uh, along the road here of, an, of the Afghan-led process towards reconciliation. Uh, mindful of the fact that the standards for reconciliation have not changed, and and the the uh, the, the uh, conditions rather that insurgents who are willing to lay down their arms and reconcile must meet in order to be accepted uh, by the Afghan government and by us. Yes. Okay, thanks. You said that you were hopeful that. Congress would come back and be more amenable to compromise. Can you talk specifically about what is making you hopeful, and are you hopeful that they will be more willing to compromise over the issue of uh, new revenues, uh, over a more balanced approach to some of these issues? Uh, we are more hopeful, uh, or rather hopeful, that Congress uh, will return in a more uh, cooperative mode. I mean, we, again, I. We, it, it, it is important to point out that we did get those trade deals passed. We did get patent reform done. We did get uh, several elements of the American Jobs Act passed uh, with this Congress, and that represents a significant bipartisan cooperation. Uh, it's not nearly enough, especially when it comes to jobs in the economy. That's why this president is going to continue to push Congress to take action on jobs in the economy. Uh, we're hopeful because of the reasons that I've stated. that. Uh, the, the dynamic may have changed a little bit uh, for Republicans in Congress and, and, and perhaps their assessments about what the best approach is uh, for their constituents uh, might have changed and, and that could create opportunities for compromise. The principal focus the President has is on uh, economic growth and job creation. It would certainly be a welcome development if, if Republicans also uh, fell in line with the vast majority of the American people who believe that a balanced approach is the right approach to deal with deficit reduction. Uh, that would be a good development uh, and a welcome, uh, a welcome indication of a willingness to compromise. So, uh, but I think it's, it's because of, uh, for those reasons that, uh, and, 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 and perhaps beyond the economic sphere, there are opportunities for cooperation too. So this President's committed to doing that and he's committed additionally to taking action where Congress won't uh, because we can't wait for Congress to act if Congress won't act. Tax cut is revisited. Will the president push for the millionaire surtax, and will that be something that well, he look, says I, is necessary? Before we get into the process of you know negotiating the way that the payroll tax cut will be extended for the full year, I, I, I'll just say that we're confident it will be. Given what happened at the end of December, uh, it, it it seems unlikely to me that. Republicans in Congress would not want to extend the payroll tax cut for the full calendar year. Uh, how those negotiations play out, you know, let, let's let them uh, get underway before we uh, begin to uh, lay odds on what they'll look like in the end. And one uh, international question. Do you have any sort of a timeline about when a decision will be made uh, about the president of Yemen and whether he can come to uh, the U.S.? 
I, I don't have a timeline for you. I can just tell you that the situation remains the same, that the United States is still considering President Saleh's active request to enter the United States for the sole purpose, the sole purpose of seeking medical treatment. Alexis. Jay, uh, related to Congress, um, obviously the President has shown how he wants to run against a Congress. You talked about their poll numbers. But there are many Democratic incumbents who are running this year and are concerned that maybe they get painted with the same brush. So how is the President going to be uh, explaining to voters that he's talking about Congress in a nuanced way? We have one chamber, obviously, uh, controlled by Democrats. So how is he going to be helping them in their election battles? Well, I, like, I think what I've been saying for the large portion of this uh, briefing is uh, that the President would be delighted not to run against Congress, uh, not to run against a do-nothing Congress if Congress, uh, Republicans in particular, would uh, do something, you know, to, to prevent him from, uh, from taking that approach. The, uh, the fact is, I think that it's pretty clear to most Americans, uh, and was uh, quite evident at the end of last year, uh, which members of Congress have been blocking mainstream, <coughs> traditionally bipartisan solutions uh, for the challenges that uh, we face economically. But uh, this President remains hopeful and committed to working with Congress, both parties, uh, to, to, to take action on, uh, in those areas where uh, Congress didn't take action last year. So uh, a, a, as far as who voters, um, I think voters are pretty sophisticated and they understand uh, where the obstacles to progress have been raised and by whom. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll trust in their wisdom uh, as, this, uh, as this cycle uh, proceeds. But, but we're really not focused on the election right now. We have a campaign operation in Chicago that's obviously up and running and we'll be doing important work on behalf of the President's reelection effort. But the President himself uh, does not have a primary, obviously, and he's focused on the work he uh, absolutely needs to do on behalf of the American people. And there's, there's a, a lot of time uh, between now and when uh, the general election campaign will be fully uh, engaged. Uh, the President didn't do an end-of-the-year full-blown uh, news conference, press conference. Can we expect him to do one before the State of the Union? It's possible. <laughs> well, I think you, you heard from the President uh, quite a bit in December uh, and, and uh, engaged with him quite a bit. We didn't have a, an end of the year press conference like I, uh, was held in, at the end of 2010, uh, but was not held at the end of 29, uh, 2009, if I, if I recall correctly. Uh, so, but, but, you know, the President had many engagements with, with you all uh, last year, and I'm sure there'll be uh, uh, many more in the weeks and months to come. Dan. Thanks. Um, it's a new year. Can you talk a little bit about what the president sees um, as what he, he's able to do to get the Israelis and Palestinians back to the table? We have the talks going on in Jordan today. Mm -hmm. We have the deadline, the quartet deadline coming up later mm -hmm. this month. But what is it that he thinks he can do on him that whole Well, first let me say that we welcome and uh, support the positive development uh, that you just mentioned, and, and we applaud the efforts of King Abdullah of Jordan and his foreign minister, Nasser Judah to bring the parties together. Uh, we are hopeful that this direct exchange can help move us forward on the pathway proposed by the Quartet. As for the President's engagement, I, you know, his, he will continue to uh, take the approach that he's taken, uh, which is engaging directly with leaders in the region, uh, empowering his uh, senior officials to uh, participate in that process and, to, and, and then to take the kinds of actions, uh, both through public statements and behind-the-scenes diplomacy that uh, he hopes will guide the parties together because ultimately uh, the, the, the two-state solution can only be achieved, this, the, you know, the, the outcome that both parties say they want can only be achieved at the negotiating table. Uh, and he is doing everything he can to, to bring them together uh, at the table. And this is obviously a challenging issue. It has uh, been so for a long time, but the President's very focused on doing what he can to make it happen. Almost two years, he will have brought everyone here. Mm -hmm. We're back in 2010. Will he bring them back? Again? Well, I, I, again, I don't have any announcements for uh, meetings or summits uh, for you today. Uh, but he'll 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 be focused on that, as he will on a whole host of issues. And, and these questions and some of the others that have been raised, I think, are a reminder of the fact that as President of the United States, President Obama has uh, a very 
uh, consuming day job uh, that he'll be engaged in uh, that is entirely separate from uh, political campaigns. And, and, and we are uh, quite, a, quite a time away from when uh, that will be uh, uh, engaged in uh, aggressively by the President. Thank you all very much.